For those of you who are visiting with us or watching online, we are working our way through the gospel according to Luke. Uh, we began uh, in late December and are continuing throughout this year and moving ahead uh, into next year. So we are in Luke chapter 4. And a couple weeks ago, I preached on the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness back in on March 26th, I think that sermon is called Answering the Devil. You can go back and connect that with this one. Uh, and then last week, we moved on to uh, Jesus's message in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. We're returning to both those passages today. We're going to read Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 30. And then we will be, towards the end of the sermon, turning to a related passage from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. Hear now God's word. And Jesus, this is after his baptism and after the Father has opened up heaven for him and declared him the beloved Son and the Spirit has come upon him. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they, the 40 days, were ended, he was hungry. And now the final climactic temptations, after 40 days of being tested and tempted. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, all history, and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he, the devil, took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding region. And he was teaching in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he rose to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the blind recovering of sight, to send out the oppressed in freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after rolling up the scroll and giving it back to the attendant, he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were testifying well of him and marveling at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is, is this not son of Joseph? And he said to them, You will surely quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard that you did in Capernaum, do here in your own hometown too. Then he said, truly, amen, I say to you that no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over the land. But Elijah was sent to none of them, but instead to a woman, a widow in Zarephath of Sidon. Also, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. 
When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. And rising up, they drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Today. Can you say that with me? Today. Not yesterday, not day before yesterday, not sometime out there in the future. We don't know when, maybe, wishful thinking, hopeful thinking, maybe sometime. No, no, no. Today. Today. Today is the day of salvation and the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end. Sin, death, Satan, destruction, decay. The day of salvation is upon us. We come to celebrate on Easter Sunday, but we come to celebrate more deeply Jesus' coming, his gospel ministry, who he is and what he has done, the perfect person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord today. But you know what? Every day we enter, we enter each day that God gives us. You understand, it's, it's only by the gift of God that you enter any day. But every day we enter, and here's what each of us reflects on either consciously or subconsciously. It's going on either in your head or it's in the background. Today, here's my big goal. Here's what I want to get done today. Today, my chief end is this. I don't know, make a little more money, rearrange my closet. But yeah, but my, today, what's that all about? Today, my chief end, my main purpose, my main point is to glorify, you can fill in the blank, and to enjoy Fill in the blank forever, today and in heaven. Now, I can tell you the way most people fill in this blank in the world. I mean, I'm sad to say, but most people fill in the blank. I am here to glorify myself or my favorite children or my favorite grandchildren. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing here. Or I'm here to, grow, uh, to glorify my favorite politician or my favorite group of people or my favorite group that I hang out with. My chief end is to glorify. Usually, it's myself. And I can tell you that even, that's certainly the case out in the world, but even in the church, I talk to a lot of people who consider themselves Christians who when they start talking about heaven, they're like, I want to know what I'm going to be doing in heaven and I'm not sure I'm going to like heaven or I hope in heaven it's like this because this is what I like to do. So what is all that focused on? Is that an awesome fear and reverence for God Almighty? No. What are we talking about? We're talking about egocentrism 101. Right? It's all, I am here to glorify myself. And by the way, I hope heaven glorifies me too. You know, I like this kind of food, so they better have that in heaven. I don't want to be on this cloud. I want to be doing this, that, and the other thing. That's the way even so-called Christians oftentimes view today and the today that leads to forever. Um, you know, I was thinking back sometimes, but you know, I'm getting old. Y'all know I'm getting really old, and I have a hard time with my memory. But I remember one of the first prayers I learned. I can remember part of it, but I need y'all's help today to help me fill in a couple blanks here. The prayer went something like this. God is great, and then there were a couple other words. And then you say, let us thank him for our food. God is great. Yeah, God is powerful. I'm going to give God that. God is the Almighty. You know, I'm not. Okay, I'll go ahead and get to that part. God is great. How does it go? I am good. God, thank you for being so great and for making me so good that I deserve to get my food and I deserve to get saved. And thank you for making me one of those good people. We're all basically good according to what most people think, right? We're all basically good. So God is great and we are good. Amen? Let's get out of here. Let's go eat. Come on. That's Easter's over. God is great. We are good. Let us thank him that we are so good. And because we are so good, he gives us our food and he owes us salvation, doesn't he, in heaven? Isn't that the way it works? You just failed Reformed theology class, I can tell you that. But that's the way most people think about it, even so-called Christians sometimes. No, let's go back to Jesus. Over in Luke's gospel, but ahead of where we are right now, in Luke chapter 18, we get a couple keys. Jesus says to the rich young ruler, when he says, good teacher, Jesus says, well, why are you calling me good? Because you know only God is good. So back to that prayer, how does it go? 
God is great. God is good. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food and for the day of salvation because it all comes from him. It turns out it's not about me and I don't get the credit because my chief end is to glorify and to exalt God and to enjoy him. If I want to start speculating about heaven, my focus should be not on myself, but on God. What an idea to enjoy him forever, today and in heaven. And back to Luke 18, Jesus tells this parable about a Pharisee going to the temple to pray and a tax collector. And the Pharisee basically says, God is great, I am good. Thank God I'm not like all these other sinners. Thank you, God, you made me special. I deserve to be on your inner team. So that's the way the Pharisee prays. And then this tax collector beats his breast and won't even, you know, look up to God and says, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, i tell you the truth, it's the second one, the tax collector who went away justified, okay? Not the first one who thinks he's so great. Jesus goes on and says this, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. It turns out that's a key to understanding Jesus. That's a key to understanding the central Isaiah prophecies about Jesus' coming, particularly the servant songs, and uh, really the entirety of the scripture. Now, during Holy Week, and I hope you reflected on the fourth servant song during Holy Week. You know, you pretty much, it's like going to, trying to get on the road without a road map if, you, if you're not tracking through the fourth servant song during Holy Week. But the fourth servant song, the four servant songs, remember in Isaiah 42, 49, the middle of 50, and then end of 52, end of 53, the five stanzas, remember the way the first servant song verse opens in, in the, the fourth servant song. Okay, first verse. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He, the servant, the one who's going to suffer now, he shall be high and lifted up. Now, he's humbling himself, but he will be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. If you're with me as I preach through Isaiah, you remember my highlighting the fact that Every other time in Isaiah, when that kind of language is used about being exalted and high and lifted up, it's always about God. But here it's about the servant, whoever this servant is. And he who's going to humble himself is the one who will be exalted and open the way for salvation for you. Well, let's keep looking at the fourth servant song for a moment. Isaiah 53, now moving through the stanzas. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. That's a prophecy about the cross and what the cross means. And then the beginning of the final verse in the fifth stanza, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered among the transgressors. Was numbered among the transgressors. Now let's fast forward for a moment to Golgotha. Good Friday. closing of the, of the fourth servant song. This is in the end of the fifth stanza. He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isn't that awesome? The one who is on the cross and who rose again makes intercession for the transgressors. So remember now, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Why did Jesus come? We've introduced this already with this series. Let's go back to it. It's at the end of the Zacchaeus story. The Zacchaeus story is not just a cute little Sunday school story for second graders. Okay? This is the center of the gospel and Jesus' first coming. For the Son of Man, Jesus says, came to seek and to save the lost. The lost. Are you now or have you been lost? Will you acknowledge that before God? Are you or have you been not good <laughs> in desperate need of a savior? A, a lost sheep needing a shepherd? The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, 
from the four servant songs, Isaiah 42 through 53, ending with the you know, suffering servant songs, uh, particularly 50 and 52, 53, we go to the exalted servant song of Isaiah 61. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to announce good news to the poor, the anawim, the, 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 those who are oppressed by the forces of the world, not just financially poor, but just oppressed, particularly the faithful. Announce good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, the prisoners. What the servant is saying is my chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever serving his mission. So let's go back now to the temptation. Because it, it hit me as we move through Luke and Luke 4 that the temptation provides a point of reference for the template for the entire gospel. Jesus' interaction at Nazareth gives us the preview of Holy Week. It, it takes us all the way through Good Friday and the resurrection. But the temptation gives us an insight. That's why Luke is placing these so close together. So now let's go back and remember, I'm not going to go through my entire sermon on this, but remember that of the devil's three climactic temptations, numbers one and three, the proposed actions are not on their face evil. I mean, Satan's not that stupid for one thing. And, and, you know, it's not like, hey, let's go to Las Vegas, blow a lot of somebody else's money, get involved in drug dealing and prostitution and trafficking and all this. That, That is not what Satan is tempting, the devil is tempting Jesus with. On their face, numbers one and three are okay. Perform a miracle. Turn a stone into bread. There's nothing on its face that's wrong with that. Number three, throw yourself down trusting and calling upon Psalm 91, 11, and 12. Nothing on its face seemingly wrong with that. And even temptation two about going ahead and grabbing all the power in all history and ushering in the kingdom really fast in a really easy way without having to die for sinners, you know, hey, you could say, hey, the the end justifies the means, right? A lot of people rationalize like that. But go back to temptation one. Jesus performed a miracle. Number one, be like God. If you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And number two, serve yourself just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. It's good. You can be like God. Go ahead and take it for yourself. Temptation number three, throw yourself down because of God's word in Psalm 91. Prompt God to go ahead and have to go ahead and save you. And number two, love yourself and be exalted instead of loving the scum that you came to save. Come on, we both know they're scum. That's the devil's message. Serve and exalt yourself. Serve and exalt yourself, Jesus. This is the issue of Jesus' ministry. It's your issue in following Jesus. The devil really wants you to cave to serving and exalting yourself. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee after all this temptation. Isn't this awesome? When Jacob wrestles with the angel of God, he comes away with a limp. Is Jesus beaten up by the devil? No. Does Jesus come scared at all that temptation and kind of, you know, silently come back to Galilee, hiding somewhere? No! He boldly comes in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming the gospel. Isn't that awesome? And he proclaims this. Um, so a report about him spreads. He's the, he's the celebrity. He's doing, apparently, several months of ministry, preaching, teaching in their synagogues. Remember, Jesus comes to us, not like John the Baptist. We've got to go to John the Baptist and try to repent. Jesus comes to us to bring the kingdom. He, came, he comes to Nazareth. He's the celebrity now. He's been doing miracles. He's been preaching. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on Sabbath. Now notice this, Jesus, as was his custom, went to church on the Lord's day. Jesus was very busy and very important. He had all kinds of people he could cart around somewhere else. But every Lord's day, he's in worship. Now, if you are more important and more busy than Jesus, I invite you to take that up with him. I'm just saying, do the comparison. So he comes to Nazareth, he stands up to read, he's the guest you know, teacher, um, of the Haftoroth, 
And Jesus declared his man messianic manifesto and our forgiveness saying it's today, okay? Now, again, there's the photo of the Isaiah scroll from Dead Sea Qumran. Um, it's around, you know, intertestamental to Jesus' time. That's the way they look, Hebrew scroll. He, he works it, he, he opens it, he's working it, and he finds the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. Now, that is one of the issues at play here in Nazareth. The poor, it turns out that's going to include even rich people and even rich Gentiles who are willing to acknowledge their sin before him, okay? That's, that's an issue. It's not just the poor people who finally need to be supported because they've been under the Romans in Nazareth. That is not Jesus' primary agenda. Um, and then he says, he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now notice this, the first recording of Jesus' public words that we get, he's not saying anything new, he's quoting 700 plus year old scripture, okay? That's, that's, that's the first recording Luke gives us of Jesus' outright public ministry. He's reading scripture from Isaiah, he keeps going, I'm gonna come back to liberty, he has sent me to proclaim liberty, and the liberty word here, ephesus, ephesus it, it means um, forgiveness, release from debt. You know how in the Lord's Prayer we say, forgive us our debts? That's sabbatical year terminology from the Old Testament. That's jubilee year terminology also. And Jesus is saying, I'm the one who announces it. Release from forgiveness of debt or sin. Release and freedom from debt or sin. Liberty to the captives. Recovery of sight to the blind, to send out the oppressed in liberty or freedom. He comes back to this and throws in this phrase he interpolates from Isaiah 58, 6, because he really wants you to get this message that my ministry is about forgiving debts, forgiving sin, and setting people free. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor, the jubilee, the great coming, it's now. Today, Jesus says this scripture, and I mean all that scripture I was just talking about, all the way from the ones in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11 that we read at Christmas time, all the way through the, the servant songs, all the way through the exalted servant song, all the way through. He says this scripture has been fulfilled today. So after reading the scripture, Luke really wants us to get this, the first public proclamation after reading the scripture that Jesus makes that is recorded in Luke's gospel is the word today. Did you hear that? Today. We're supposed to get today. Mark, by the way, over in 1, 14, 15 says, now after Jesus was arrested, after, excuse me, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time, the word there is kairos, it's like, you know, existential moment time, key moment time, um, is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus here in Luke says, today this scripture has been, there's that word again, fulfilled in your hearing because I'm saying it. In other words, even before I go to the cross, it's here because just like God says, let there be light and there's light, Jesus is saying it's all happening. It's done basically because I'm declaring it. I mean, that's, that's God talk. Jesus declares he is the prophet. He is the messianic promised one. He is the royal king. He's the divine king. He's the suffering servant. He's the glorified servant. He's the whole thing and the one who can set you free from your sin and give you life eternal. He's it. It's not someday. It's today. It's not somebody. It's Jesus, specifically Jesus, who has come in history to save us. Do you believe in him? Will you hear his word and his invitation to salvation? Jesus declares and brings, fancy word here, but the eschaton. He brings the end. You want to talk about end times? He's already ushered them in. That's what he just said. This is an eschatological statement, and if you believe in Jesus, you are already bridging into the age that is to come. Jesus is faithfully wise, I'll fill in the blanks for you, heart and choices in the spirit overcame temptation each kairos he faced in the wilderness with the devil in person in nazareth 
with the devil's proxies, in Jerusalem with the devil's proxies, at Gethsemane, and at Golgotha with the devil's proxies. But back to Nazareth for a moment. You know, we talked about this last week. They want home cooking. They want to get the special treatment. And Jesus says, no. This takes us back not just to what they're asking him, but the first temptation. Do a miracle for us. Now think about the pressure on him. This is his hometown. When you want to show the people you grew up with, hey, y'all didn't get it, but I'm really special. You would, I would. Jesus doesn't have to do that, right? Your mama's there. She, she's put up with a lot, you know, raising the son of God and going through all this stuff, you know, the whole, you know, virgin conception and everything. And, and, and here he's finally at home. His brothers, his sisters are there. I mean, this is a lot of pressure on Jesus. Just do a few miracles. You've done them down in Capernaum. Show us and we're all on board. You understand the temptation here, right? And Jesus rejects it. It's temptation number one all over again at Nazareth. Isaiah 11:10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who will stand as a banner for the peoples, he is in the spirit of wisdom. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 now. Of him shall the nations, the Gentiles, inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Jesus has already seen the big picture. This is not a home cooking thing, hometown cooking thing for Nazareth. This is a bigger story. And if you want to get on board, you need to humble yourself, not seek to be exalted. Isaiah 49, 6 and 7, the second servant song. We'll come back to this with Paul. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the redeemed of Israel. I, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation. That's by the Jews, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is already a prophecy over 700 years before Jesus comes. That's the servant. And they abhor him pretty fast. And rising up, the people in the Nazareth synagogue drove him out of town. Fast forward to Good Friday. But they, here it's not the Nazareth synagogue people, it's the chief priests and rulers of the people, all cried out together, away with this man. Get him out of town. Luke. 4:29. They brought him outside of Nazareth to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him off the cliff. Back to Good Friday. When they came outside Jerusalem to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. Notice this, so they could throw him off the cliff. Remember temptation number three? Throw yourself down. It's the same language. Okay? Throw yourself down from here. God will take care of you. This time, it's not his time. Just like in John 8 and John 10 when he passes through crowds. Passing through their midst, he went away. It's not the time yet. But God doesn't send angels. It's just not the time. If you want to read a whole book on this one verse, <laughs> and it excurses on 430 and what's going on there, Longenecker's book, Hearing the Silence, Jesus at the Edge. Uh, what's really going on here... Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through, notice God doesn't snatch me out of the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. But ultimately we have to go back to Psalm 22, don't we? Because Good Friday did come, the time came. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Temptations 1 and 3, if you are the Son of God, then the rulers scoff at Jesus, Good Friday. He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, let him come down. The soldiers also mock him in the same way. If, if this is the king of the Jews, let him come down. The criminal crucified with him. If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. Temptation number three, over and over again. And you know, Satan doesn't like verse 13. Satan just quotes, quotes 91, 11 to 12. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up. What's verse 13? Why am I talking about that? You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion, Satan is described as a lion and a snake, both 
and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Genesis 3, 15. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. How can it be her seed unless there's not a male progenitor? Well, yeah, because we're talking about the virgin birth, virgin conception. Her seed, he, her seed, shall bruise, break your head, and you shall bruise his heel, which all brings us to today. Risen, Jesus has trampled the snake. <laughs> Jesus has defeated sin and death, and he will trample Satan. Satan's already, he's already on borrowed time, and he's going to go down. Today, today. So what do we do as Christians in response? The Apostle Paul over in 2 Corinthians says this, verse 21 of chapter 5, For our sake he made him, this is Jesus now, who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, with, with, with Jesus, okay, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. You know, the, the grace is, is laid out for you. Like right now, the grace is laid out. Don't receive it in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, notice that language here, that's the same as the favorable year, okay, that Jesus preached about. In a favorable time, I listened to you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. We're back to servant song number two. Okay, same song, same song that Jesus is fulfilling now. And, and Paul is claiming it right now. And here's what he says. Behold, now is the favorable time. You catch that? Behold, now, today, is the day of salvation. Paul is saying the same thing that we're hearing all throughout the scripture that Jesus says is the center of understanding the gospel and following him. Today is the day of salvation. And then here's the application. Verses 11 through 14. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. We're not the problem. We're not harsh here. We're open. We're open in our heart. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections for the world, for the world. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? So, do you believe? Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe he's risen? Do you believe he's the savior of sinners? Here's the call to response. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. What should we do with our hearts? Widen them to the love of Christ and the love of God. Widen your heart also. Widen your heart to God, to the price that the Father and the Son have paid for salvation, for the grace that you've been given. And widen your heart to the mission that he gives to you as a Christian. I mean, if you're not engaged with Jesus, you've squandered the grace that was laid on the table for you. Don't compromise God's truth and standards. Don't be partners in lifestyle or worldly values with unbelievers. Christian, you're a Christian, okay? Now, of course, we love and want to reach out to unbelievers, but are we supposed to get in bed with them? Are we supposed to get in parties with them? Are we supposed to party hard with them? Are we supposed to compromise our standards with our bodies and our life to be with them? No. You're not supposed to be yoked with, if you become like them, then salt is lose its saltiness, right? You're, you're no good. Love them, but be different. Be lovingly but clearly distinctive. Don't compromise to get along. Reflect the light of Christ to unbelievers. Rejoice and live like this in the year of God's grace because this is the year of God's grace. It's open wide to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do I hear what I'm saying? Let us live in it. Live like this is the day of salvation because you know, it is. It's a time of decision and opportunity for everyone. Death is coming soon. Judgment is coming soon. But you know what? Jesus has defeated all and will open the door to anyone, any lost, any poor, who turn to him by his grace extended to them. Let us live like that. Let us be messengers of his grace. Let us be different.
and be the light of the world, reflecting the ultimate light, Jesus Christ, today. That's what Easter is about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.